Hi, I'm Seth Tibbet, founder of Tofurky, and this is another episode of Awesome Vegan. Welcome, everybody. Happy Sunday. I'm Elizabeth Alfano. It's another episode of Awesome Vegans, and I am so honored and so thrilled to be with Seth Tibbet. I will say, Seth, that this is the 50th interview I've done on Awesome Vegan, so thanks for Congratulations. being 50. I, of course, again, want to thank Seth for being one of the original hippies, basically, who True. brought us plant-based options. And we have a plant-based revolution today because of Tofurky. Tell me about the history of Tofurky and how you started it. Well, uh, sure. Um, so actually, Tofurky, the company, started in 1980 when I invested $2,500 of my naturalist life savings and uh, started making tempeh in Forest Grove, Oregon, in the back of a local co-op that made I could make 100 pounds of tempeh every night by myself in eight hours. And that was my dream. I thought tempeh was poised to be the next granola. And so I started selling it around Portland, and I would drive in my old beat-up Datsun around to these small little natural food stores and restaurants in Portland, because at that time, there was no conventional grocery store like Safeway Amazing. or um, Walmart or anything that was selling anything plant-based. So it was really just the co-op and uh, natural food market that was just poised for growth. And I soon got a distributor and we started selling up and down the West Coast, Tempe, and we were then... Um, actually needing a bigger place and I was tired of working nights so I went up to rent an old elementary school about an hour and a half east of Portland in a little town called Houston, Washington and I rented this uh, beautiful commercial kitchen it had a gymnasium and four classrooms for 150 bucks a month mm. and those are the days folks and I lived in a treehouse actually that I built because I wasn't making any money I was losing money and I actually made $31,000 in take-home pay the first nine years of business. So nine. It was, wow. that, that wasn't 31000 a year. It was 31000 okay. over nine years. So it was 300 right. bucks a month. But wow. Anyways. But you lived in a tree house. I lived in so a tree house, $25 yeah. a month for the trees that I was renting. And oh, you had I, to rent the trees. Yeah, okay. I did. But I, I like it was somebody it. else's land, but I built the mm -hmm. house. Anyways, and then in 1995, I was noticing that there wasn't anything really uh, protein, and there was like burgers and tofu hot dogs that you could eat uh, different times of the year, but at Thanksgiving, there wasn't anything, and uh, there was also a lot of um, comedy around it. Like, I would buy the Oregonian Sunday comics the week before Thanksgiving, and there always was like some ha ha dig at vegetarians. And mm. like, do you want white tofu or dark tofu? Um, I'd like both, please. Yeah, I would too. And so I thought, uh, well, maybe there's a market for this. And so, mm. with that and the help of my friends at the Higher Taste, we developed a tofu turkey that people thought was a pretty crazy idea and named it Tofurky, which I was told was also a very bad idea, <laughs> but turned out to be okay. So I, I love these stories when everybody says like, you'll never make it, you'll never make it, you'll never make it, and then boom, you're Tofurky. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the products that you have. Before we do that, I want to say shout out to Tempe. We're not going to be talking about Tempe that much today because it's no longer really your mainstay, but I personally, you can go to elizabethalfano.com. I use Tempe for my stuffed peppers. I use tempeh for my lasagna. I lose tempeh for my pasta bolognese. So if you're looking to make kind of a meaty sauce, it's all in the spices, people. That's why meat tastes as it does. It's the spices. So, but you don't want a more processed version of some of the ground plant-based meats that are out there. Use tempeh as your base. So, a, a, totally. It's a, I totally agree. Yes. It, it's the healthiest it's a miracle food. It is a really. miracle food. And you're, you're talking about protein. So like a slab of tempeh is going to give you 14 grams of protein. And then I season it up with soy sauce, paprika, and cumin. Yeah. Okay? That's cumin, people. This is what we're talking. And then boom, you've got a meat sauce with tomatoes yeah, Actually, uh, onions. it would be even a little more if you had like a four-ounce serving of tempeh would be up around 20 
uh, grams of protein. So oh, it's even more than I thought. Okay. Yeah. okay. And that's fermented. It's one of the most usable proteins for the human body and to absorb. Stable. It's so great. It is so great. Okay, but but you hung out there with Tempe from 1980 to 1995, and then it was boom, tofurkey. I'll have to say the tofurkey product that I rely on are your Italian sausages. Oh, yeah. And I have a very tough time finding the actual tofurkey roast. Well, it's around, uh, you know, it's mostly during the holidays that sure. we have it. So it's in all of the Whole Foods. It's in... A lot of the grocery stores, Vons and um, Walmart, I believe, still have it too. So okay. it should be around. Okay. Um, and can I can I say so? For, first of all, your your marching orders, everybody. For Thanksgiving, go to the store and buy tofurkey. There you go. Your second marching orders, if you like to tool around in the kitchen like I do, I have a recipe going online of stuffed turkey breast that oh. I've made out of seitan that I've wow. uh, flavored with mushroom broth, and then I stuff it with mushrooms and chestnuts and bread and some sausage from tofurkey. Sounds yummy. <laughs> so, Let's do it. Yeah, so lots of options, everybody, for Thanksgiving. But you also have burgers. You have deli slices and Perfect. then I think you have cheesecake that just showed up we have all of that and uh, we have about 35 tofurkey products normally they will show up in the grocery stores or in the produce section because we like produce and we see a lot of uh, the vegetarians of course and everybody shops in the produce section so that's where it is and we just actually launched a burger in the uh, plant-based section that'll be coming to Target and Walmart and other stores in January, in Veganuary, which Wonderful. we'll talk about later. Oh, so I'm getting ready for Veganuary. We're Veganuary. excited about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's really delicious. And, uh, you know, so we're really excited about that. And we have the cheesecakes, which are frozen. Those are under the Mucho brand, which is a new brand that we created for other plant-based offerings. So the Muchos should be coming to your store soon. We had them in the Tofurky Feast last year. We had a little mocha chocolate um, cheesecake and it was great response. So we were like, hey, let's make it year round. Okay, I'm all over that. I have not tried. In fact, I was gonna ask you today, but I figured it wasn't possible if you could bring me a sample uh, of that. I would have totally Gosh, done darn that. It. Uh, but I'm all over that. I haven't tried it yet, folks. I'm gonna do it and I'm gonna report back. So you can find that mucho, obviously, in the frozen section. Do you imagine that you will be leaving produce and going to the meat aisle? What, what's your feeling on that? Um, you know, we'll we'll have to wait and see. I think it's a different packaging mm. and it's a different approach. And mm -hmm. I know that it's a broader approach. But on the burger end of things, we thought that produce was good because there is so much in the meat section now, you know, with Beyond Meat and uh, Light, Light Life has a burger and, yeah. you know, Impossible probably go in there when yes. they come out. They have so come out. I they mean, have mm -hmm. that sort of area of the store covered. So we thought, Smithfield. let's look at the produce section because a lot of the produce uh, managers wanted to get in on that trend mm -hmm. of that um, beef style. Mm -hmm. burger so that's what we created mm -hmm. very yeah. interesting uh, you guys have heard me say it here before on the show awesome vegans but my anticipation is that the meat aisle or the meat case is no longer going to be called the meat case and then it's going to be called the protein case and people are going to be able to decide for themselves if they want plant-based protein or animal-based protein and i see that we'll get to predictions later in this show like we always do but i see that as something coming down the pipeline uh, so for the for the business folks out there, because this has become a big deal now, everybody wants to get on get in on uh, what you've been doing for decades, but what Beyond Meat has perhaps made popular, which is making money with plant based items. Do you could you explain to us because just because you have a good idea, which in fact everybody said wasn't a good idea at the time, it's one thing to make Tempe in your basement. It's another thing to get it scaled and distributed across the United States. And you're a hippie who lives in a tree house. Thank so you. how did you make that? How did you, what business acumen did you need? What business tips could you give us? These are not easy things to do. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, I was a tempeh maker and that was my love and mission, you know, and having the mission. And that's, I want to talk a little bit about mission because mm. I think that, you know, having that vegan mission is really important and I have seen that it's not just Tofurky that has a mission it's literally every vegan business that I've ever seen 
has not only the mission to make money, but they have the mission in their heart to make the world a better place and to create, you know, low on the food chain, tasty, low on the climate change scale foods. So uh, for whatever reasons, you know, and there's many reasons to develop vegan businesses, um, that mission will keep you going during the hard times because the pleasure of doing business right off is a lot of, there's some pain involved in that. And so if you have just a money play after five years, I would have just said nuts to this, you know, I'm making 300 a month and I'm starving. Like, why would I continue that? But the mission allowed me to get to my tofurkey moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our secret superpower as vegan business owners that allows us to succeed at a higher rate than an average business place would do it. So having the mission is number one. And then, you know, just figuring out as you go along, I I knew nothing about business, uh, really. I was a naturalist and I was a teacher. So there's a lot to learn and you're just trying to become less stupid every month as you go along, you know, and just Good learn as that, you go. Folks. And the longer you stay in it, the less stupid you become. And so I still got a lot. There's still lots of meadows of stupidity out there that I've yet to experience traverse. And, <laughs> and traverse. But, uh, you know, it's it's really kind of, there's a lot of common sense involved. You don't have to be a Harvard MBA. In fact, a lot of times I think, you know, it's better you look at some of the bigger businesses and uh, food businesses that have started. Uh, you know, you read Fast Food Nation, for instance, all those guys that uh, uh, started these big chains were all high school dropouts and they just really had a great work ethic and you know a, a vision and they kept uh, chiseling away at stupidity as they went along so um, that's it but scaling up is always you know the problem like first you need to kind of prove the concept you have an idea you need to like go through sort of a test market time where you're you know, selling to maybe a few little stores and you're, I think doing demos is great. For, like I did a lot of tempeh demos back uh, in the 80s and it's so good because now you have customers telling you right then and there what they think of it, what could be better and you're getting ideas. So that's a great thing. So after you've proved the concept and you're trying to scale it up, um, that makes it a lot easier to get investors, whether they be friends or family or uh, venture capitalists, depending on the size of your dream. Once you've proven the concept and you have something that looks like it's going to go, um, then you can search for money and start scaling up. But as you say, making something in, you know, we make our R&D batches, you know, five pounds of this and it'll be great. But then when you try and make, uh, you know, 500 or 5,000 pounds of this at a time, it always changes. You'd think it would just be multiply times 500 and get to, you know, what works at one pound, but it's, it doesn't because it's all how it goes through machinery and that changes the texture and flavor. So it's a um, amazing learning curve to scale up your business, but can be done. It can be done. I do love what you say here. So for you budding entrepreneurs, I do love that uh, you have to basically be willing to fail again and again and again, because so much of it is trial and error, throwing spaghetti at the wall, see what sticks. You, you push it through the machine. Does it work? Why didn't it work? Let's figure it out. You're constantly problem solving. Exactly. And you have to love going back to ground zero, square one, and starting again, and starting again, and finding it out. And I, I didn't know that vegans are statistically more successful than other businesses. You had mentioned that, is that yeah, accurate? Yeah, uh, I don't have like data on that. Mm -hmm. This is me um, conjecturing, but I do think that, you know, having that mission in your heart, you know, beyond just the money play is, really crucial to success and I would not be surprised to mm -hmm. see that that is the case. I don't think there's been any studies but that's a, a great point. Well, um, what I love about that is I like to call this the bingo effect. When you have your skill set that meets your passion, 
It's like the jackpot. And now you are 150% of yourself because you love what you do and you have a skill set for it. And so vegans basically have that. If you have an idea, you see that there's a hole in the market and a, a product like tempeh could come right in or a, a tofurkey could come right in and you have the passion to back that up so you're not going to stop because you didn't make the money you were hoping. You're going to keep at it until you get it because it's your passion that drives you. It's like bing, 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 ching, ching, ching. You've hit the jackpot. And, you know, and you have to say, too, even if the wheels fall off, which happens, and not a lot, every sure. business, um, you know, succeeds, but sure. if you've had this mission and you've been working at it, and even if you fail, you've left the world a little better for what you've been doing, and that's the beauty of the vegan businesses is that yes. uh, even the ones that fail have had an impact, and then somebody will build upon that, and they'll look at what went wrong and go forward so uh failure is going to happen but you know if you've done something good it's it's your legacy and uh, you know it's it's not an entirely wasted set of years i think even michael jordan says that the only reason he was successful is because he failed a gazillion times and he got back up and he kept trying I know that I am personally so grateful to all the people who are out there struggling and trying and perhaps living in a tree house to make it happen. And it's one of the reasons why I've, I do so much cooking, as you guys know. And uh, But I've started working with companies to help them with newer recipes for particularly non-vegans, to help non-vegans start trying vegan and making it delicious for them with my meat sauces and stuff. And I see how hard these people work and how different it is from going from your kitchen in Chicago or Venice, uh, where I am, to, you know, putting out hundreds of thousands of items. And it's really tricky. And I'm so grateful to those people, so happy to work with them, uh, but also so grateful that they're willing to be at it and at it and at it. It is not for the faint of heart. I'll say that. No, it's not. But it's a joy, too. It's really a joy. I mean, even those years living on nuts and berries and not a lot of money, I was I was living the dream. And, mm. you know, if you have that sense of uh, mission and accomplishment, you know, uh, money is not the only way to keep score. Right. That is so true. And of course, it's the journey. It's a little cliche, everybody says, but you got to love the day to day. Maybe you get the big bucks at the end. Maybe you get to the end. Maybe you don't even get to the end. But if you're loving the day to day that you feel it's making a difference, uh, it's a, a very much a win. But you're, talk you're talking about at one point that, you know, if you can test your product, then you can demo it and test it. Then you can go out and go get money. So of late, we've seen a lot of vegan companies get bought out by meat and dairy, basically. So we have Light Life and Field Roast, which is bought by Maple Leaf. We have Dannon, which is bought up Silk, I think. And there are many, many others. Uh, Good Karma Foods, which I love, was bought up. I forget by whom. Sweet Earth was bought up by Nestle. I could go on. What do you think about this? Well, you know, as a consumer, it's always kind of disappointing to see that. But at the same time, I understand it. And it's not a, a totally bad thing, I think. Um, you know, companies grow. And a lot of times there's people like me that really we're not trained to run huge companies. Mm. And so you get to a point sometimes uh, where your choices are, A, do I keep doing this and risk running it into the ground because mm -hmm. it's just become too big of a risk and to the skill set is no longer what I can handle? Mm -hmm. um, or do I try and pass it on to somebody that's more trained in doing that? So um, I think that I would rather see these move on even to meat companies because then um, certainly fail or, you know, and I don't know what was going on in the internal dialogue of the companies at that time. But the thing about it um, is, too, that these big companies, a lot of times they'll lose the magic you know, yes, of, of marketing, right. and they'll mm -hmm. do that. But you look at, like, the meat companies, and this is something I think we're going to talk about, too. There's two kinds of meat companies in response to this growth of plant-based foods. There's the ones that say, we need to squash this, and mm -hmm. we need to get our legislatures to pass laws so that they can 
you know, not uh, sell plant-based burgers or call their plant-based burgers a burger because that's confusing. Like, how can we do that to the poor consumer? Uh, and then there's the other ones that, like you say, they see it as protein and we're in the protein business and we're going to, you know, add that to our, we're going to just change our product line. Mm -hmm. And so the ones that I think see this as an opportunity, Tyson's, Nestle, those are the ones that are going to come out in the long run on top. Whereas the ones that are just like, we got to squash this, uh, those are the ones that are going to be left behind. So I really fully agree. I would much rather see meat and dairy buy these companies up than have these companies fall apart, not have the ability to scale, not not reach as many people. So if you think that a small company can reach maybe the West Coast only, but a large meat and dairy company can reach the world, they've got those resources, they've got those distribution outlets, I'd much rather see that. And those companies that choose to invest and put their money into it, it's because they're doing what we're hoping for. They're trying to make that switch. For moral reasons, I probably wouldn't say that. They see the money in it. I don't care how they get there. They're trying to make that switch either in full by, you know, it's not going to go vegan overnight. So either in time, they're making that switch by adding more product lines or they're not making any switch. They're just cutting the meat down and putting in more plants. I, I couldn't be more thrilled by that. And I'll also add that meat and dairy function on very small margins. And so when you start selling, you know, even one meal a day, as Susie Cameron says, one meal a day less meat and it's going to go to a, a plant-based option instead, that makes a big difference in bottom line meat and dairy. And when meat and dairy stops making money and plant-based is making more money, you're going to see more and more of that s switch. So I think when you start eroding that foundation, it's a natural flow into more plant-based foods. Yeah, we just need, you know, Plant-based foods are having a moment now, and we're seeing yes. incredible growth. But at the same time, we are still uh, plant-based meats, 1% of tiny. animal based meat. Mm -hmm. So it's very tiny. You know, plant-based milks have been more successful, and they're, I think, up at or in the U.S., around 13% of the milk market, which is amazing. But with meat, uh, you know, we have a long way to go, and it's a really, it's a big job. So we really want all vegan companies that are producing great tasting yes. vegan foods to succeed because yes. it's way bigger than any brand, any yes. one brand. And, um, you know, brands got to do what brands got to do in order to survive into this bigger world because there is a lot of, when you think of that, like 99% of the protein is going from animal-based protein and 1%. Like if we're at 1% now and there's there's pretty big companies now you mm -hmm. know that are doing uh like we're doing a lot of it's just boggles my mind to try mm -hmm. and think of like what would it look like to make you know a hundred times the yes. amount of food that we're making now and wow how and could you do that? There are those predictions. So I think it was Bloomberg. I will get back to you guys exactly on this. But they're predicting that by 2030, this comes from an interview with the Good Food Institute in Bloomberg, by 2030 that the plant-based meat industry would be something like $180 billion, or no, $240 billion by 2040. So, you know, that's quite quite a bigger deal than where we are now. I think right now we're at something like 18 or something. I've but seen it's different all the time. It's ones, changing every month. Yes. But yeah. Uh, but so, you know, they're expecting enormous growth. And I would think the numbers that we'll see in 2020 after a year like we've had in 2019, I got to think we're moving the needle and we're more than 1%. We'll see. We'll see. Yep. We'll see. But uh, oh, also, I'll throw in another statistic. I was at the Good Food Institute conference in September, and someone threw out a number of 19% for mil milk, plant-based milks. I've heard 13, I've heard yeah, 15, they were, I've heard 19. They were tracking for 20% by 2020, I yes, think, last time right. I checked. But That's right. I was so, being the conservative. Yes, but, but the point is well taken. There are hurdles, you know, if meat is plant-based meat is still at 1%, there are clearly hurdles. And so I want to ask you about two hurdles in particular. You mentioned legal hurdles. We'll get back to that. I want to ask you, because you've been around for a while, you've been doing this for a while, we've been here before and plant-based was squashed. In the 70s, there was a big push 
We didn't have the taste that we have now, and that was a huge hurdle, and we didn't overcome that, and so the 80s came around with its money push, and we were squashed. Do you think plant-based will make it? Uh, yeah, and <clears throat> to your point, I think that it's much tied to the taste and yeah. the texture of the products now, and that's why we're seeing this. You know, Why are people going to plant-based foods now? It's they're just so much better. I mean, mm -hmm. they're incredibly better. Everything from uh, you know cheese to the meats. You know, I don't know if you know this joke, but the old joke used to be on vegan cheese. It was like, did you hear about the fire in the vegan cheese factory? Cheese still didn't melt. It was perfect the next day, which was true. The first cheeses did not melt, and um, okay. now you know you have Miyoko's and all these others. Follow oh, your heart. So many and so yes. many ones, and they do Vital melt, life. and they do. Uh, they're getting closer and closer. This is a very new field, though. You're competing against cheese, animal-based cheese, which has been centuries of uh, development something that the first cheeses that I saw were in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think as the taste and texture improves, um, that uh, that's the secret sauce that'll make this different than other starts. Mm -hmm. um, because you can even go back below the 70s, you know, into the 1890s and that's right. see this big thing, that's especially right. in Chicago. You're yes. from Chicago, yeah. but Chicago was ground zero for vegetarianism in the, right, in the 1890s. But yeah. You know, um, I've just seen such an incredible development in the 40 years that I've been in business, and I've seen nothing like what we're seeing now in terms of the growth and the pace of growth and just the taste and texture of the products. Because we always say taste is king, value is queen, everything else is marketing. Mm. And, you know, mm. that's the main reason that, um, you know, the the portal to the human heart is through the stomach. Yes, absolutely. And so I think these foods will succeed and they're just going to get better and better and they're great now, but they'll be greater in 10 years. Yeah, I'll just say that I just had a wonderful camembert from France, from Le Petit Vegan, and I just had a great blue cheese out of Scotland from Boot Island, Butte Island cheeses. So, I mean, the, the taste is really getting there. So it's really very much an exciting time. And then, of course, so he was mentioning the, what people care about, taste, price, convenience. We are getting our real estate in the grocery store so people can go to Carl's Jr. or Burger King or you can find it in the grocery store now. So the things people care about are there. And then you have the business behind it, which does not favor animal agriculture. It's a very inefficient business model at your very best. You're getting nine calories of grain, one calorie of chicken back. What business person would ever signed up sign up to put in nine calories and only get one back that's nine pennies you get one back on your nine pennies it makes no sense and and cows are much worse it's like 35 to one so that's really a good point too because um you know the any time that there's a more efficient way of producing something um it's it's going to succeed you that's know right. you look at like everything from cameras that used to be you'd send your you know film away and three weeks later yes. you'd get back and half of them would be like too dark you know yes. and we changed that and uh, I remember those days you know yeah, it's just yeah. like uh, even you know the first Topher the first tempeh brochures I type by in my typewriter and I use press on letters you know and I scribble out to the big letters that the typewriter couldn't do and you know then that you if you really had money you'd go to these typesetters and they'd do yes. magic in a couple of weeks you'd get back your brochure and now you just do it all online I yes, mean right. the trend of efficiency is right. really um, happening and plant-based foods are so much more efficient from the farming aspect, the land use aspect, the water, the use. production of them. You know, it's just um, so much easier and more efficient and better for the world, of course, and the environment. Of course, and but, of course, just the the concept of why would you feed food to food? Why would you feed grains to animals right. and then hope to get something back like eight months later or whatever? You would just feed 
food to people and move on and right. take the benefits of that business equation. Uh, but there are challenges. So even though we do have things like the environment and the business equation in our favor and the taste and scalability and convenience, we have you know people who don't want to see this take place. And so there have been, particularly in the Southeast, um, Missouri and Arkansas and another state, I believe, Mississippi. Thank you, Mississippi. Uh, you've seen legal challenges. And so right now you are going through a lawsuit, I believe, with the state of Arkansas. Tell us about that. Well, we're two states, actually. Missouri, we were the first ones to sue uh, a state, and that was Missouri in August of 2018. And just uh, last summer, we took on Arkansas, who <clears throat> also had the same kind of um, thing, and they're they're all sponsored by the local cattlemen mm -hmm. that have the legislatures in their pocket, and um, you know it's we're we're doing it. Uh, well, it's one of the beauties of being independent, family owned, is that you know we're not a we can do what we want. We're yeah. not no one's telling us what to do. Beautiful. So uh, we're getting a lot of like high fives behind the scenes from others in the industry, which is great. But what we're really trying to do, uh, you know, it's a it's a solution looking for a problem, these mm -hmm. laws. You know, there there is no yes, consumer. They're saying we're, we're confusing the consumers by calling something a veggie burger. And that's, of course, uh, you know, a, a very wrong statement. Nobody is confused um, when you say plant-based burger or whatever so it's it's totally a fabricated um situation and you know you would think that the courts like the local courts may be harder than the federal courts mm -hmm. on something like this sure um, because they they have something to gain here yes but um you know we think that it's important to fight back mm -hmm. and it's important because there's i think well uh, at this count, I think there were 13 or 14 states, just about all red states, mm -hmm. that had uh, a law either passed or on the books to um, be set to vote on that were trying to make it harder for plant-based and cellular-based meat mm -hmm. companies to um, work. So we just think that it's you need to fight back. and. Because uh, Tofurky's place in these lawsuits is you, you can't just be like the Good Food Institute by itself is not, and uh, they're not wrong by this. They're not a party that has been wrong. So right. we are no signing for on as potential damage because it's like sure. we can't, um, you know, adjust our labels for one state. You know, we need to have something that. You know, work in all, all states mm -hmm. and of course it's just very um, anti-business for them to do this. It's actually so anti-consumer. It's anti-consumer Be totally. Because uh, consumers can read veggie before the word burger and that describes the product perfectly and the point of the laws is to protect the consumer so that they know what they're eating and if you can't call a tofurkey veggie sausage sausage no one knows what a roll is right. or a log or I don't, what would you call it if you didn't call it sausage and therefore what would the consumer how would they know what it is they, so it's consumer oriented i feel they they seem to have no problem uh, really? identifying Surprise. a turkey burger and knowing what that is but right. like a veggie burger like right. what in the world's a veggie burger right uh, i love that you say that i love that you say that that they already are using the term that they're trying to get out. Right. Yeah. So our philosophy is first they came for our tofu dogs and I said nothing. And so that whole thing, so you've got to, uh, you know, we want to say something. We don't want to yes. be not saying anything. But uh, I do think that these laws will be laughed at, certainly, mm -hmm. in 100 years and be off the books mm -hmm. all around. Just like, you know, you see these clickbait articles sometimes about crazy laws you can't kiss in public or something you yes, know I mean, yeah and now people go ha ha so well so when do you think you'll hear back on this and um i think upton's actually was successful in overturning something in yeah mississippi, mississippi. dropped out mm -hmm. and uh that's good missouri is where uh we had one ruling that didn't go in our favor and now we're appealing that so we're 
that's ongoing and Arkansas there's an injunction temporarily mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. you know they're all working their way through the courts and mm-hmm. that's a long process we've been dealing with Missouri now for going on you know a year and a half and really? just when you thought you know you had uh, an agreement behind the scenes the courts didn't want to deal with it they said why don't you guys work it out <laughs> yourselves and that proved to be unsuccessful you know we thought we had agreements a couple mm-hmm. of times and then mm-hmm we didn't so Mm -hmm. it's back in the courts but um we're gonna fight the good fight well so i appreciate that you're doing this as well because again i believe that this is something that affects the consumer so you're doing a public good here and a public service but they don't have to fight it alone so remember you also have a voice we still at least for now we still have a democracy where you can use your voice it is in fact your strongest tool and you don't have to wait four years to vote you vote three times a day every time you put your dollars down for the purchases that you want that are better for your health, better for the environment, better for animals. So use your purchasing dollars and use your voice, particularly if you live in the South and you don't agree with these um, things, you can contact your representatives and you know, uh, don't don't expect that politicians are gonna help you out. They are not here for you. Politicians are here for themselves. So if you want change, change comes from us. Change comes from people like Seth. So uh, back us up if you're, if you Absolutely. are in the South. Yeah, uh, it's just kind of a quick thing that I wanna touch on. Uh, we'll never get to it in this conversation in full, but just kind of a, something I'm gonna leave you guys with before we do some exit questions with Seth. Um, You know, one of the beautiful things for plant-based items is that we are starting a domino effect. So if you start switching over to plant-based items, that means you don't have to grow as much grain because you're not feeding it to animals. You need much less. You're just going to feed it directly to people. That means you have extra land at your disposal, which is what we need. You have extra water at your disposal, which is what we need as we go from a planet from 7 billion people to 10 billion people. So then you start changing how you farm. So I think this is part of a very large discussion about how we are going to be more efficient in our farming techniques and what new tools will be created and new technologies will be created to do that. So it's, I don't know if you have any comment on that. It's not really a question, it's just to say big changes are coming. Yeah, and you know, I mean, Everybody says, well, what about the jobs of the slaughterhouse workers or the farmers and everything? I got to tell you, tofurkey doesn't make itself. (laughs) So there's plenty of jobs in that sector. And there's, um, you know, with the farmers, we're really looking at uh, just changing the product line Mm -hmm. and uh, not the actual end product. So, I mean, the actual end product is going to be different. So... Uh, But, you know, the other thing about having a more efficient food system is that, yeah, there's more land for uh, crops and everything, but there's also more land for wildlife. And and trees. Trees, you know, right now. Carbon in uh you know everybody talks about grass-fed beef you know blah 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 but a lot of that you know um the cows are taking over like range in oregon um that is the range of the coyotes and the wild horses washington state is just now trying to kill all these wild horses so that they can uh have more land for cattle and so There's really environmental impacts for, you know, everybody loves, you know, nature and birds and Mm. uh, habitat and parks and everything. But, you know, these animals um, are all under stress from this Mm -hmm. um, expanding meat uh, footprint that we see on the planet. And um, so I think that we need to remember our furry and feathered friends Absolutely. out in the wild and you know have less make sure that they have habitat to live their lives sure and it's equation it's an equation that doesn't make sense because as you go from 7 billion to 10 billion you can't keep giving cows more and more land because you first of all you have more people that need a place to live and then you'll you'll have no more land to keep these animals inefficiently grazing. It makes no sense. And then you take that and you extrapolate that you're making this food that makes people sick. So then you're bankrupting healthcare. 
Medicare specifically, because you're getting people getting older, they're all getting cardiac disease basically at the same time. You have huge societal issues where it just stops functioning. So with, and it, here's the beauty in it. How rare is it that one solution can affect so many things positively? Uh, we're talking about the environment, we're talking about our healthcare system, and back to jobs, which is where we started. Tofurky doesn't make itself, neither does Light Life. I think Light Life just spent $3.1 million to build a 240,000. 300 and something million. Sorry, actually. 310 million. I'm sorry, 300. Three, three million doesn't go very sorry, far. Sorry, anymore. sorry, sorry, sorry. 310 <laughs> million dollars to build a 240,000 square plant right in the heart of animal agriculture in Indiana that's going to create 460 jobs. And if you imagine every household has four people in it, 460 jobs is about affecting 1,800 people. So, you know, it, we're, we're still employing people. We're still making things. We're still farming. We're just doing exactly. it smarter, better, differently. Uh, okay, folks, I've got some extra questions for our pal here. You guys know on Awesome Vegans, I ask these questions all the time. These are going to be one word answers, most of them. Uh, so just visceral right off the top of your head. What's your favorite snack? Uh, potato chips. Woohoo. Okay. Any flavoring? Any like? Barbecue. Of course. Of course. Man after my own heart. Okay. Uh, what is? What are we always going to find in your fridge? Um, smoked tempeh burgers. Yeah. Mm. It's two words, but I've been <laughs> smoking these tempeh burgers and they're how, unbelievable. How do I get my hands on that? Uh, I'll send you some. All right. Oh, well, I like how you roll. Okay. You've been traveling. You walk through the door. What's the one meal you can make in 10 minutes? Super fast. You're starving. It's always good. Um, you can always have nutritional yeast toast. <laughs> I love nutritional yeast. I put nutritional yeast on my popcorn. Oh, I so, love that. Uh, so super good. Yeah. Uh, is there a phrase that you live by? So I'll give you an example. If I've had a tough day, I like to say to myself, nose to the grindstone, eyes to the sky. Uh, a person has two lives. The second one starts when they realize they only have one. Thank you, Confucius and Seth Tibbet. Uh, I got that from your email. It is yeah, Confucius. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah okay. I love that. Yes. Okay. So... Obviously, you have a sense of purpose. I think we all get that from you right away. But you've done many things in your lifetime. What is the one thing you'd really like to be known for? Um, you know, I, I think helping to pioneer the plant-based foods industry when it was very small uh, would be the thing. But, you know, and, it, and it, it wasn't just me. There was many others that actually, you know, had a big part in that too. So I don't want to take you know, more credit than credit's due, but um, it's just been, you know, the real joy of my life is seeing the explosion of plant-based foods. You know, my father was born in 1896, believe it or not. He saw, I actually saw the Wright brothers fly, oh, and wow. then he saw people walk on the moon. And so I've always been wondering, what is my Wright brothers moment, you know? And I think that my moment is just having been alive when there was no plant-based food options anywhere, basically, and even in the natural food stores, um, to actually today where we're just seeing them everywhere. I mean, I, you hardly even need Happy Cow now. Yes. I mean, I look at it all the time to find out. I looked at it last night, but I could just walk over here to Carl's Jr. and sure. get a Beyond Burger. I yeah. mean, it's just so come so hard and so fast and so quickly, especially in the last couple of years. It's just awesome to it see. So awesome. that's my Red Brothers moment. It's so beautiful. Uh, do you have any pets? And if so, do you think they're any different than farm animals? We are petless right now. My pets are the birds, the wild mm -hmm. birds I feed. Wild birds, I always make sure that they have uh, food to eat. So I put it out um, all through the winter. And uh, we just lost a cat. Uh, oh. that we'd had for 13 years. She was a stray, oh. so that was hard going through, and so currently petless. Petless. Uh, what are your predictions for the future? Well, uh, I would say that, you know, those plant-based foods trend will certainly continue. You know, I was reading the McDonald's ex-executive saying, oh, this plant-based burger thing is going to flatten out just like gluten-free. Uh, yeah, this is not a fad. Right. This has been going on since, you know, like we referenced, the 1890s. 
And, you know, it's a fool's game predicting the future. But uh, I think certainly, you know, within 100 years, the, the paradigm will, you know, people are saying we won't be eating any animal protein. That's a stretch. But uh, I do think that the paradigm, the new paradigm, will be fully plant-based at that time. So 100 years, whatever. And I think we will cross the threshold in my lifetime. I think it will happen in 100 years. And I think we will look back and people will say, shame on those horrible people. Can you imagine how awful they were and the things that they used to do? We're going to look at it like the dungeon torture chambers of like the 1600s, the medieval torture chambers. That's what we're going to be seen as. Okay, so my last question for you, my very favorite question as well. What do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Wow, 10 years ago? uh, I guess... You know, just the pending popularity of plant-based foods mm. is, is how it would unfold. You know, maybe we would have been more aggressive in mm. um, building, you know, plants, bigger plants, mm. sooner just to be prepared. But, you know, we've grown kind of like organically and haven't sold any equity. So that's just, it's worked out fine. But... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just obviously knowing the future. And if I had known that the Nationals baseball team were going to be World Series champion, I would have bet a million dollars on it back in May. And now I'd be... Could have, would have, I could have. Fun, okay. I could have funded my own tofurkey plant, my $300 million tofurkey plant. Well, I if I got in on Beyond Meat at 25, I could have retired today. So, there you, go. you know, uh, I know that you all share with me how deeply grateful... I am to you, how personally, deeply grateful I am for all that you have done. And you you. have paved the way for what we have today, which is a plant-based revolution. And there were moments when Seth was talking, you guys maybe saw me, I was almost getting teary-eyed because it it wouldn't have happened if you and some others did not pave the way. So I am deeply grateful. I am also grateful to you, everybody, for being with us today. Thanks for being with me, Seth. Bye, everybody. Bye.